Okay, um, the recording is running, and uh, to make it official, it is March 11th, 2021. This is a meeting of the Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council's Emergency Preparedness Committee, and if I didn't have a screen to read that off of, I might get confused. Um, roll call, uh, we're not going to wander through 60-some people on a roll call if you have not registered, if you did not get a you know registration uh, slip come back at you in the email, please shoot me an email so we make sure that uh, we've got you recorded as having been here. Um, the recording is in fact on, so we're in good shape there. Takes us over to the meeting schedule. Uh, first thing on the agenda, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, um, we're a big believer in the last thing you want to do is meet somebody for the first time at an emergency or a disaster. So typically when we meet in person, we do a meet and greet, but um, we're going to um, blow past that. And to the degree that we've got guests that have joined us, um, I know there are several from out of state that are with us. Uh, we really appreciate you making the effort to come by, see what we're all about. And uh, hopefully you can learn something from our flailing. So um, as the chair of this esteemed group, I will call the meeting to order at this time. And I will need a motion, uh, someone to motion that, in fact, we open this event. So moved. And do I have a second? I second. Uh, who was the second? Put Tom Fitzhenry down. Okay, thanks, Tom. Got it. Okay, uh, with that, um, approval of agenda. Anybody that's uh, uh, wandered through this thing would have had an opportunity to see what we've got posted for agenda. It's rerun up here on the on the screen. First hour is dedicated to doing our administrative cleanup stuff and try to help people understand where our effort is on going forward, um, and then. Um, following, you know, that, is there anybody that needs to add, change, delete, uh, anything to the agenda going once going twice gone, uh, agenda so, is so approved and next up is updates, issues, and good efforts. Are we ready for this? Here we go. I know it's a shock, but Greenland is actually smaller than what a lot of people want to think. Anyway, just thought that'd be fun. Anyway, that's an update for you out there. Um, I have to tell you that the past three months have probably been the busiest stretch for this committee um, since I've been involved in it. I mean, it has been hair on fire everywhere. On December 17th, we did meeting number four of the underground utilities project mapping team and please note the acronym so i don't have to keep um, relating that long uh, name uh, we, for short we call it uumpt meeting number four um, some serious traction happening there and we'll talk about that uh, further on down the road here january 6th the minnesota geospatial advisory council uh, based on the feedback from the Minnesota geospatial community, said it ha held its setting priorities meeting. And again, a, a topic we'll uh, take a look at here in a bit. January 27th, uh, the U.S. National Grid Implementation Workgroup online meeting. Um, you are going to see some serious transition with that group um, as we basically cut it loose from a sponsorship and it stand up on its own own two feet here in uh, second quarter of 2021 January 28th there they were again the underground utilities mapping project team which is meeting every month 35 individuals across the public private enterprise that are engaged on trying to figure out how we come to understand what's beneath our feet is the bottom line of it because nobody knows. February 15th through 19th, hats off to BJ Colstead and Randy Knippel for doing uh, presentations and a workshop at the Wisconsin Land Information Association. Uh, Randy and BJ did a three-hour um, 
initial training thing that's just composed of module one introduction to u.s national grid module two emergency manager's perspective on use of u.s national grid and module three how how you can technically bring u.s national grid into your mapping uh interfaces and the rest which we are going to be treated to brandy doing a rerun of that later today february 23rd uumpt presentation to the minnesota clean water council policy committee why that's important is that group controls a quarter of a billion dollars in uh, funds, and they've gained interest in our project with this underground utilities effort because they realize it holds potential for um, a, a, a lot of stuff that um, they're directly impacted by. Meeting number six of that group, February 25th, March 3rd, Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council meeting was held online. So here's what's in the in the queue to come up, and we won't really catch a breather until the end of April. March 16th, Critical Infrastructures Project Team is uh, planning to meet. Stacy, I got that right, didn't I? I'm seeing a head nod, so we're good That's there. Right. Okay. March 25th, Underground Utilities Project Team, April 2nd. Uh, LCCMR 2022 grant requests are due. We are putting in one uh, based over at Share Geo is going to be the entry point for expanding the ELM or emergency location marker project in Minnesota. April 19th, return to the Clean Water Council. What this is effectively going to do or keep our fingers crossed is generate out of the Clean Water Council before we spoke to the policy committee, which effectively controls the money. And they thought what they heard was substantial enough that they want us to present to the entire Clean Water Council. And out of that, we're hoping for a policy statement from them thinking that we're, if you will, worthy of consideration down the road. April 19th through the 22nd, uh, GIST, Minnesota Mar Department of Transportation, is sponsoring that. So this is the GIS people that work in the transportation sector. There is a Georilla slash Geomoose presentation taking place there. And uh, we're batting it around at Share Geo as to whether or not to write them a $1,200 check to have a virtual booth um, in support of the Geomoose, Georilla thing. And for those that aren't familiar what Georilla slash Geomoose is, is basically how the Minnesota Department of Transportation um, basically creates for its engineers and others a dynamic view um, in mobile of where all of their stuff is in the right of way. April 28th, uh, the next uh, U.S. National Grid Implementation Online Meeting. Details are going to be published over at what will be emerging as the U.S. National Grid Institute. Note the URL change, but the old one would, would work, which includes USNG, IWG. But uh, the implementation working group is going to get folded under the Institute. April 29th, the Underground Utilities Mapping Project Team, April, uh, May 27th, same thing. So you, you, you get the drift here. Every one of these utility mapping project team meetings are a substantial effort, kind of like what we're, what we're doing here today. Um, <clears throat> the 2021 priority survey results that the Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council blessed off on three of ours, which are, if you will, manned, uh, the underground utilities data sharing team, the critical infrastructure data workflow, uh, that Stacy's responsible for, and then the U S national grid materials effort led by Randy, um, made the cut. There were something like 28 or Corey would know the number exactly, but I believe it's 28, isn't it, Corey? I can't lie too much with you online, but. Lie as much as you want, Steve, I promise. <laughs> I'm not going to correct you. <laughs> uh, it was like 26 to 28. We actually had a couple that were, that didn't even make it to the the meeting, so. And, and so the way that whole thing works is they, they bring into their seance um, a, a matrix that identifies whether or not the project has funding, whether or not it has people, does it have a champion, and does it have a vision? And so basically, I think we can pat ourselves on the back that we got three 
um, from this committee that meet the criteria in the eyes of not only only the the committee but our our fellow uh, individuals out there in the community that uh, voted for those so that's that's a good thing and basically just the, the follow through on that is the intention and I hope the 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 GAC follows through with this is to in some form or fashion um write a piece or whatever on what these projects are, what they mean, and then get it to the legislative community in the state so they can be tuned in to, to these projects and understand why they're critical. And in, in some, some cases, um, you know, impactful to the bottom line of the state. Okay. People, uh, we do that update. Uh, the only substantial event that I know of is uh, Mark Cott's GIS Warrior um, on his way out the door. Mark has been um, in the lead at the GAC for an extended period of time and uh, sort of like the pictures of Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. <laughs> it's taken a toll. So not that I'm any spring chicken anymore either, but you know, it's kind of a, a fun thing to think about that uh, we've got uh, um, somebody that, I don't know, Corey, what's he been there, 15 years on the council? in some form or fashion? At least it's probably even more. And yeah. he's been the, the chairman for more than eight years. So, But he got himself in trouble because during the pandemic, he got tapped and wandered on and over to, I don't know, all the places he was working at, but started doing some of that GIS stuff. And then the light bulb went on for some folks that are like, oh, maybe this is important stuff after all. So anyway, uh, EPCIT, I just want to touch on that for a bit. Um, as I have been in the last couple of meetings, because we've been in the process of doing this transition that amounts to, as I, I call it, driving down the freeway 70 miles an hour while not only working on the engine, but building it. And somebody's doing the Fred Flintstone thing to keep the car rolling along. So um, the old website that was uh, hosted by Mingeo, um, that rascal has been effectively pulled down and i've been working with allison and um uh, nancy raider to this particular site had all kinds of different layers behind it um talking about the structures collaborative and the use of gis and flu and spring flooding and all the rest of that stuff and that's actually we we're pulling that stuff down and it's going to get repurposed over on the new site. So if you go to the new old website, you're going to see that there's just a link over there to run you over to where our truly new site is located. And uh, if you wander on over to mgacepc.org, that's where we live. And I've gone through here and tried to update some stuff. And I'll show you here in a, a little bit about uh, so, some of the tweaking that the, has gone on over there. Um, but the point is, is this is where we live now. And if, as I flap my gums many times about our Minnesota situational awareness viewer um, is linked off of that. Um, then over at mgacepc.net is where, if you will, all the project stuff is bundled so that uh, teams have got a place to store their stuff and work on their projects and, and the rest of it. Um, I'm going to um, jump up and down about this one. The EPC owns a Zoom account. So if, if you're playing this game of when you're meeting with a group and you're up against that 40 minute clock where Zoom turns you off, if you need access to the EPC Zoom account for whatever project you're working on, all you got to do is ask for it. So it's it's simple as that. And as I've said before, I just don't want people like dialing to Afghanistan or whatever. And other, other than that, it's good to use. Okay, issues. I got to believe those Texans are would be crying if they saw this. They're not so big after all. Anyway, so here we go. Issues. <clears throat> uh, so we put the effort in to stand up some social media websites, you know, this Twitter thing. And was this Facebook? Is that what it's called now? Facebook, and then we're over on the the uh, on uh, LinkedIn. 
So LinkedIn, I'm, I'm going to continue to posting there, but there's only, I, I think I've got one person that signed up after me blabbing about these being there. And I know, you know, a lot of organizations blast across these platforms just to make sure they can connect with everyone, but it doesn't make any sense for me to continue to do it unless it's honest to God being used. So um, I'm getting ready to pull a plug on it unless I hear some screaming or gnashing of teeth about them going away. So there you go. Um, on the other hand, the MGAC EPC YouTube, although you're looking up there thinking six, six subscribers, who cares? The reality is um, so far we've had uh, 270 visits. We're averaging about 100 a month, which again is not a lot. But as we continue to put up our training videos there, you can watch the curve on an uptick of people coming through here to look at this stuff. But more importantly, um, because of the groundbreaking effort that's involved in this underground utilities mapping project team, we've actually been approached by Damage Professional Pro, and they're re going to repost to an educational website, and that reaches 45,000 people. So just because maybe our numbers outright aren't that high, understand that the reach is uh, still out there and significant. Okay, next up is I just want as an, as an issue, I, I literally don't think a day goes by when I'm not seeing place key hawked in my inbox. And you kind of know how I feel about all that is that, you know, anytime we got a vendor trying to own location, that's a problem. And if, if you're interested in running a checklist about any time you're approached by what three words, map code, Google Plus codes, natural area coding system, Munich orientation convention, and all the rest as to why you don't want to be using that stuff, there's a checklist over at the USNG store that walks you right down the list. And if you can figure out that there's better approaches through any of these platforms that override what's written there, by all means, let me know, and maybe I'll stop blabbing about this. So that's over and under the frequently asked questions at the USNG store. Okay, last issue here is leaders are needed. Education, uh, we've got kind of two projects that are sitting on ice over there. The Geospatial Emergency Management Specialist, although Corey's group has kind of picked this one off as a area to start, you know, at least keeping some engagement among the people that have stuck up their hands, that if somebody gets themselves in trouble as a, a GIS person with they're out sick or a disastrous hit and they need some more help or whatever the case might be, you know, those volunteers just to kind of keep some dialogue going and the rest of it, they're going to work on retooling that, that emergency management specialist program that was developed over 10 years ago and it's kind of sat on ice. And again, there's approximately 100 GPS units. If somebody wants to step forward and uh, create a, a training program for grade schools or whatever, um, the capability to do it's there. Outreach, well, it's kind of a process of all of us, um, but we got some heavy work to be done in rework of the resources to support that online delivery of outreach. And if anybody out there is interested in either of these kind of efforts, by all means, drop me a line at chair at mgacepc.org and uh, we'll try to get you set up. All right, good efforts. I know you didn't realize this, but the cows rule the United States. So this is the proportional area controlled by each of the sectors that are there. I'm very disappointed by the fact that barley for beer is only this small little area there. I think it should be, well, okay, never mind. All right, pressing on. Okay, um, good efforts. The automated magnetic declination diagram was in fact released. It's wandered into all the GIS press. We're seeing a lot of interest from folks in Europe. I've seen this, you know, this article re reprinted there extensively. So, um, uh, a a uh, feather in the cap of Jim Klassen for having worked through this whole effort to automate the creation of the magnetic declination diagram, publishing it in a way 
that um, facilitates some of the stuff you'll hear Randy talking about here in a little while. So the URL is down there along the bottom. I think it's actually HTTPS, isn't it, Jim? Did I screw up? Probably. Okay. Yeah, everything's HTTPS. Yeah, it is. It should be. Sorry about that, folks. So just so you're aware of it. Um, and once again, I repeat it over here. But uh, Joseph Kursky, which I think many of you guys know, who's kind of one of the gurus over at Esri, he beat us up on, you know, that we needed to kind of reformat the delivery page in a way that folks that really can't comprehend why you'd want to do some of this stuff or different ways of thinking about using the tool, um, we did an extensive rewrite on that page. And that's up and operating. And uh, on your way in, you get a chance to wander through there and figure out what's going on and how to think about it. Okay, hats off to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, BJ Colstead and Randy Knipple for the delivery of their presentations at WLIA, which has prompted was over in Wisconsin um, a lot of discussion about yeah, maybe we ought to be thinking about this U.S. national grid thing, which is a federal standard. So anyway, ShareG also set up a virtual conference booth, and that's still online. And uh, we're going to be retooling that thing so that it delivers the story in a little bit more effective way. Um, and there's a big section there on U.S. national grid resources that you can go take a look at. Um, coming out of that, Randy, I, I apologize if I'm stealing any of your thunder here, but one of the things that Randy has done is just through the dialogue that he got going offline with a number of GIS professionals over in Wisconsin, he just rolled up his sleeves and effectively created the each one of those little squares, when you click on it, will give you the option of opening either a 10 thousand uh, 10,000 meter um, aerial view or mapped view of that location. And hopefully this will also support the um, introduction of U.S. National Grid in a more extensive way over in Wisconsin. And he just did that on his own. And he's in the process of working one for Georgia right now. Um, the effort over in Wisconsin is is in some degree on fire. Um, here are the counties that we are aware of at this point that are actively engaged in trying to do some sort of U.S. national grid project in their area. The two I think that we're most excited about are Bayfield and Sawyer because they represent the, what's called the Berkey Biner Trail System which is a, um, a, a cross-country ski evolution. And just like in the aviation world, there's this unfortunate thing that the rules get written in blood and they had a very unfortunate incident happen uh, on their trail system. And as a result of it, they started thinking about there's got to be a better way of marking our trails um, and so that we can be better off in the delivery of emergency response to those trail systems. So my hat is off. I sat in on one of their meetings and they are dead serious about fixing their problem. And we're going to do everything we humanly can to support them and uh, move their project along. Uh, and interestingly down here, um, there's a, uh, an effort uh, and I'm going to say his name wrong. And Fred, I hope you're not online right now. Yowsley, I think is maybe how you say it. And the folks in Wisconsin that are tuned in probably could help me out with that. But the bottom line is um, we're trying to set them up with uh, Cobb County, Georgia, which has done an extensive uh, build out of U.S. National Grid and emergency location markers and the rest of it. So Fred can get the vision um, for, for Dane County about how that might work. And given the fact that Madison is in Dane County, that's, that's a substantial development. <clears throat> Cobb County, Georgia, uh, they continue to have their hair on fire. Literally 30 minutes before this meeting started, 
Um, I just got another uh, fine tuning order came in the door for uh, emergency location markers to help them out. And uh, Cobb County, Georgia, Georgia right now has got somewhere pushing the range of 2000 emergency location markers installed. Um, they are getting ready to do a, a very heavily advertised foot race in um, a park there that's going to include a t-shirt the, in the goodie bag with an emergency location marker on, on the t-shirt. So they're, they're whole hog on this. And for any of you that would kind of like to get a feel for what they've been up to, this URL here down along the bottom uh, will tune you into their uh, Esri story map. And you can go down the side and read about some of the stuff they've been up to. So pretty cool. Uh, last but not least, I want to mention a uh, big thanks to Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt. Um, she has made the effort to get our project team for the underground uh, work group or project team um, over to uh, in front of the Clean Water Council. And uh, without her assistance, we would not be there. And for those that aren't familiar with Victoria, for many, many years, she has been the only um, policymaker, decision maker, um, politically connected individual that has taken an honest interest in what this community is about and how what's going on here can be leveraged to um, improve government operations. So big kudos to her. <clears throat> okay. I'm coming up for air. Who, what did I forget? <laughs> Anything? Going once? Going twice? Gone. Okay. Other victories or defeats? Same thing. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the project team reports. And for those of you that, again, are joining us for the first time, uh, Steve Swayze here. Um, um, I don't know how I got <laughs> into this slot, but I'm the chair. Randy Knipple is vice chair. And then uh, our leadership team is made up of Brad Anderson, Brian Huberty, Corey Richter, and Stacy Stark. Uh, jumping on in here, what I would like to mention is <clears throat> um, I've done a complete, I don't want to back that up and say it a different way. The, the, committee has done a rewrite of our committee charter and that got approved by the Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council on March 6th. Corey is nodding her head, which tells me I got the date right. Okay. So um, what that did, the original framework or vision, I just kind of want to talk about this for a second. When the council decided um, to support the various committees and whatnot, they thought of committee work as being like a one and done deal and that it would be like a year. Well, this committee was stood up in 2003 and like, we're still here. <laughs> so that kind of blows that idea out of the water. So anyway, what, what happened on this rewrite version seven of our committee charter was to bring into line the reality that there will always be a need for um, bringing geospatial capacity to the emergency services sector. And whether it's U.S. National Grid or underground pipeline or um, getting a program in place to qualify people with a level of geospatial expertise, so on and so forth. Um, it's going to be a rolling deal as these projects come in the door and out the door. So that's what that's all about. Drop over and uh, you're free to steal it to go start your own committee if you'd like. Okay, then there are uh, the 2020 accomplishments in the 2021 work plan. Um, you can find the details. They've been reloaded there um, under the work plan section on our front page. Just a reminder that there's an, they are in fact there. 
Okay, last thing I wanted to to talk about before the project teams report out is that I continually get questions about how do you join the EPC? How do I get on your mailing list? All that kind of thing. Well, again, on that front page, there's a discussion about there's three ways. If you just like to, you know, limit your involvement to receiving information about EPC meetings, webinars, trainings, social events, whatever, send your email and your business address phone number to me at chair at mgacepc.org. It's all you have to do. You're all set. Away you go. If you'd like to become actively engaged in a project team, then I ask you to go to this webpage. And, and basically, it's on the, on the .net, and it's a login from the homepage in the upper right-hand corner. But there it is. And right there, if you, if, I mean, if you go to the .org and pull down to the Join Us section, you'll be able to find that link, and away you go. So once you're there, you're going to be able to use the link on that page to fill out a form, which will connect your, uh, which we will be able to um, collect your, your detailed contact info. You can log into the project team, you know, which, which ones you're interested. And the effect of it is also it signs you up to gain access to the EPC private accounts. Because if you go through our, some of our websites, you'll see something that's tagged private. And that's so that groups can have discussions off the record and um, behind the curtain, so to speak. But, um, you know, so that they can effectively push a project forward. And then last but not least, stood up last spring as this pandemic thing got going on. For a long time, we had a, a if you will, a, a geospatial response team uh, concept running. And we kind of abandoned that because there always was a lot of pushback from the emergency response community. So Corey came up with the brilliant idea that maybe what we really ought to be thinking about is a, an approach which recognizes that there might be the need for support to someone else in the GIS, just the GIS community. And so we have a form that if you're willing to volunteer on your free time to be able to support if a county or a organization or whatever loses our GIS person um, due to a, a disaster, then we've got a way for you to log in, do your qualifications and create effectively a pool that is available that if something pops up, we got a way to, to start looking for people immediately. So there's that one. All right, that takes us to Corey. You're on the floor with your volunteer initiative. Thank you, Steve. So. This is formally informal as far as the group goes. Uh, we're not submitting reports or that sort of thing. Uh, so far we have a good group of folks that we've gotten together once. Uh, I'll be sending out another meeting request here soon. I've been trying to do this on a quarterly basis that we just get together and touch base and just introduce each other to each, you know, that we're doing our introductions. Um, so far what we've discussed is the group would really like to take a look at everything from training resources to uh, looking at all of the documentation and, and items that are out there, whether it's from NAPSIG or anywhere else, and what it takes to be a competent GIS person in disaster. Um, and this is where exactly this GEMS piece kind of comes back in for us is this is a, a chance for us as this volunteer group to revisit the curriculum that's here, see if it's current with uh, needs that are out there, if we need to do any updates to language or course or any of those things in there. And hopefully at that point, we'll be able to develop a champion that would be willing to, to lead this effort on forward. Uh, but yes, volunteering to be part of this group, all it is is, I mean, if you think about it as a, a a coffee club where we all have the same interest in helping in disaster. And we're really looking to support each other and, and uh, back each other up and answer questions that way. We're not looking to go in and take over somebody's EOC. So that's where we're at. Okay. Thank you, Corey. And, and so, as I mentioned earlier, kind of the first thing that they're going to do is a, a, a glue the pieces together is to review the GEMS curriculum and uh, try to, to clean this thing up and formalize it uh, going forward. Is that correct, Corey? 
I'm seeing a head nod. Thumbs up. And if you want to talk to Corey directly, uh, across the bottom of the screen is her contact information. Okay, that takes us over to the critical infrastructure assessment uh, project team under the data structure. And as I mentioned earlier, their first meeting will be Tuesday, March 16th, or I should say first meeting of 2021. Uh, Tuesday, March 16th at 9 a.m. And the floor is yours, Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we've been uh, kind of working behind the scenes on this project for over a year, but we're, we're organizing now um, as a work group to try to do a few things, um, raise some visibility of the project so that we can get uh, counties involved in verifying their critical infrastructure information. Um, we're focusing on fire, police, schools, and healthcare. And for those of you who are, haven't heard me talk about this before, um, there's just at the, the federal level and the statewide level, some of the spatial data sets that are used um, aren't uh, there isn't a there isn't a verified and uh, accurate current form of these data that's available to um, to anyone to use that's open and so we're tr we're trying to make an open data set um, and also push these verified updated data up to the federal sites um, and this is I think more of an issue in some of the the rural areas so if you are working in a, a county or in a um, other jurisdiction and you have access to that kind of information. And again, we're just talking about basic thing, just the basic EMS um, fields right now. For uh, the rural areas, that would be great. Um, we're, we're making headway working through the different counties in the state um, using a, a project that I'm working on with the University of Minnesota. Um, but so as Steve mentioned, we're meeting next week, a small group of us to, to kind of uh, look at the next steps, which are going to be trying to raise the visibility, get this information out to others so that we can verify data statewide. And then the next step, um, rolling up the data and sharing the data. So we're, a, I had hoped that we would have something to share. Uh, by the beginning of this year, and we're a little behind on that schedule, but I think we'll have a version one um, in not too long, and then we'll we'll just keep doing this on a rolling basis. Um, if you're interested in this kind of work or just skip discussion, being uh, if you have testimonials or case studies of why this is so important to have this kind of spatial data available across county lines, um, that would be helpful to, to communicate. I think um, we'd appreciate your, um, your work on this committee, or just even if you, if you wanna share a story with me, that would be great. Um, Matt Goodman from St. Louis County in their emergency uh, management operations, he's a GIS specialist there, um, is going to present with me at the Association of Minnesota Emergency Managers Conference in September. So we will be um, talking about this project there. Uh, that's, about, that's about it. Um, I think we'll have, we'll have more updates next time. The, the slide that's shown there is the application that we developed at the university um, as part of another project, but one of many, obviously, that requires this updated verified data, including the EPC's MinSave application and a lot of the work that Randy's working on in Minnesota. Um, we uh, are using this application to have people verify location data for, for the state of Minnesota. So... Um, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Stacy. And if you want to get in contact directly with Stacy, 
uh, course down along the bottom. I've uh, posted her email and uh, I think it's fair to say you would encourage people to reach out to you. Would that be correct, Stacy? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stacy, very much. All right. Um, I get thrown under the bus on this one because I've been more or less hands-on with this thing since um, it came out of the gate in August of last year. Um, here's kind of to give you the sense of the plan going forward with what's going on with this underground utilities mapping project team. The background piece on this is, is that in simplest way to describe it, I would tell you that the the gain that is that is potentially there is is substantial to the degree that it may work we may be talking about billions of dollars um basically if you've ever had or gotten ready to dig in your yard or watch street repair go on or, or the rest of it you've seen some crew come out and run a sensor across the ground to try to figure out what's under there well, that, if you will, is 30-year-old technology. And what we're trying to do is bring forward the concept that with accurate geospatial data, there is, if you will, no reason why we couldn't actually be in the virtual reality, the 3D modeling world, all the rest of it. But we've got to get everybody to play in the same pen together. And so this project kicked off as a collaborative effort between um, the um, the Minnesota uh, Gopher State One Call group, and um, originally they approached Chair Geo, which I think many of you know I serve as the executive director for. It didn't make any sense to me to have it living at Chair Geo because of all the suspect eyes that would come as a result of that. It made much more sense to move it into a state, another state body, and that's the reason it ended up over at, um, if you will, uh, the Emergency Preparedness Committee. So I'd been in a dance with that group for the better part of three years. We got rolling in August of 2020, and then you can kind of see that the run down there. 2020 project team, Pilot projects have been started over at uh, Gopher State One Call. And then uh, YouTube, we, as I indicated earlier, we're posting everything that we're developing up on YouTube so that others in the United States can see what we're doing. We believe this is a first in the nation effort because effectively we are trying to deal with this thing holistically. We're not looking at just like one element to figure out how to fix that. We're looking at the whole kit and caboodle. 2021 research presentations, articles, and we'll be starting our best practices piece. Uh, 2022, we're looking to release in the first quarter to align with funding in the state, our best practices, which is going to identify places where maybe money ought to be applied. Uh, we anticipate we're going to end up being at some national conferences and we're going to try to facilitate a feedback loop to hear from others. Um, the Gopher State. Uh, one call self-help expands in 2023. We're going to be looking to try to, to create volunteer compliance with uh, the things that come out of the best practices document. If there are some places where it just makes sense to do regulatory to the absolute positive minimum, that's where we want to be with doing that one. And then GIS tech maintenance, it doesn't make any sense to uh, try to work to get to this point without having an ongoing process that continues to update and improve the GIS awareness of what's under the ground. Ultimately, um, the chair of the group, uh, Barb uh, Cedarberg from Gopher State One Call, has basically given us three mandates, uh, the creation of more accurate maps, the ability to share data, and finally, it resulting in safer excavation. And if you want to learn any more about that, drop me a line at chair at mgacepc.org, and uh, I can fill you in more on that one. That moves us on to, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's some opportunities out there with uh, GEMS, which is kind of being taken under its wing by the volunteers, the GPS program and our education pipeline. <clears throat> Outreach conferences, we're 
trying to do that, as I explained here with WLIA, and then we need to try to do a better job of improving our online delivery of information. That takes us down to geospatial assistance, which I believe Brian Huberty is online. Uh, that is correct. And specifically we're looking at uh, remote sensing data sets on how to acquire them or request them. And the group, uh, which consists of Shelly Carroll, Len Nee, um, Tom Fitzhenry, uh, Jim Klassen, myself, and I think I may be forgetting one other person. Anyways, I've met just a couple of times and we posted a bunch of uh, background materials, including a new draft document by the uh, FEMA that actually came out in 2018 on geospatial assistance, of which there's one chapter in remote sensing, which is really well done. But the key question in all of this is how do you acquire or request imagery? And literally in this past few days, in the past week, I more or less had some conversations with the head of DHS, former head of DHS remote sensing, his name's Chris Berhaney, uh, because he now is in the doghouse in DHS land because he pushed trying to get a fire uh, sensor that was uh, built by the Air Force. It was not classified, turned on. It was launched in 26, no, 2008. It was turned off, I think, in 2011 or 2012. I don't remember specifically, but it basically looks at the Western United States, including Minnesota. And it's on 24 seven and in the Paradise Fire of California, it would have probably picked up the fire four hours ahead of time. And for whatever reason he got in the doghouse, he could see it coming last summer and I hadn't talked to him until he called me Friday he says, hey, I, I, he hasn't even been able to get his email because they've taken him off the uh, distribution list uh, for within DHS. So who knows what's going on there? And ironically, I also talked to Glenn Russell, who's the FEMA remote sensing guy, and he wasn't even aware of it. This was going on. And uh, anyways, uh, FEMA is still, uh, I had e e emailed our group this morning that he did get my email and he was asking the regional offices for assistance on how to communicate that from the states to the regional FEMA offices, and there really isn't a process. There might be a few exceptions like Florida or Texas, for example, but it's still a gap in their plan. It's how do you communicate? What do you need for the disaster? So for example, in 2011, uh, there was the Pagami Creek fire, which was 90,000 acres, and you can see it on weather satellite imagery, especially in the winter. It looks like a big lake up in northern Minnesota, but it basically burned about 90,000 acres in one day. And to put that in perspective, that's about 150 square miles, and Minneapolis is 50 square miles. So three times the size of Minneapolis. And it just, again, illustrates that if you're going to see something like that emerge that quickly and blow away, you're going to need satellite systems, you're going to need aircraft systems, and for people on the ground, possibly even drone systems. Again, it's a question of, are the resources there to get at it? So as in my email this morning to the group, uh, you know, I'm sort of at a loss of, well, what do you do next? Because it's basically a communication problem of how to get resources, both at the state and federal level, tasked for any of these emergencies. And it's going to take something, I don't know, letter to the governor, the president, legislature, media, I don't know. Uh, maybe a YouTube video of Steve ranting and raving with Oli might do it. That actually might, actually that might have more effect, <laughs> come to think of it. <laughs> but anyways, if, you're, if you wanna chat about this, uh, feel free to email me or call me and uh, we'll sort what the next steps are. The next steps, I really don't know on how to proceed into the future. And type C, you're on my slide, but again, it's how do you scale this stuff up? Because it's not just fire, it's floods. Uh, if we have a Gulf oil spill in Lake Superior from the Superior Refinery, that requires an airborne radar system, for example. Does the U.S. have those? No. Uh, Glenn Russell, who is former Coast Guard, he told me the story during the 2010 Gulf oil spill. The Coast Guard had these radar sensors, but they mothballed them. They got rid of them two years ahead of the Gulf oil spill. So BP had to rely on a Canadian and Icelandic uh, airborne radar systems for helping clean up the Gulf oil spill along with uh, the airborne data system folks. So 
again, uh, there is some progress being made. There's more sensors getting thrown up, but can we get access to them in a timely manner and get it out to the public? That's the more important question of what Christopher Haney was trying to get at is there should not be any reason why somebody can't look at like a, a weather map, like when the storm front comes through, why isn't there a fire front kind of map out there to help people visualize where they're at and where the fires are instead of just the nightly news of leaked photos from the uh, reporters out there. Again, technology isn't the problem. It's ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, thanks much. And uh, again, reinforcing uh, down along the bottom there, uh, that's contact information. contact information for Brian. Uh, give him a holler if uh, you're interested in talking about this issue further. It's it's complex, and um, I, I'm behind in uh, helping them get down the road. But anyway, here we go. Uh, then we got the situational awareness viewer uh, continues on. We're seeing some good hits on it. Um, hopefully, we can com uh, continue to build some momentum with that um, as being the place to go during uh, a major disaster to look for related information. And uh, we're currently running the COVID stuff up through there. Um, and that takes us kind of the thought that the critical infrastructure and the USNG effort um, are also gonna be piggybacking on the Minnesota Situational uh, Awareness Viewer going forward. And we're still trying to, if you will, fine tune a group that's going to work harder on that thing going forward. You can get there directly, uh, minsave.org. So down there across the bottom URL to get there. Uh, response, U.S. National Grid. We're going to hear a lot about that. Randy, you got the floor for two minutes. <laughs> oh, you told me I was going to have five and you were worried I'd use that. I'm only going to use one. So how about that? Uh, well, you've already mentioned the WLIA conference. Um, we we did both a half, a four, three-hour workshop um, along with BJ Colstead um, and a presentation on the intro to the USNG. Um, following that, um, there was some interest by uh, somebody from uh, from some of the counties out there in uh, in pursuing creating maps in Wisconsin. Um, as I was starting to pull things together, um, it was really an opportunity for me to kind of take another look at streamlining the process of creating the maps. And as a result, ended up creating the maps for Wisconsin. Um, and uh, Steve and I then also worked on creating a map repository in the USNG Institute website. So now we have a place to put all the maps. So that's going to be good. Um, and then in the next iteration of, of refining it further, started working on creating maps for, for Georgia as well. And I'll touch on some of those details in the second half of the, uh, of the meeting here. Thank you, Randy. Really appreciate it. Okay, give me one second. I got to clear something. There we go. All right, so next up, um, we're up to old business and new business. Do we have any old business? And the clock is running. Going once, going twice, gone. All right, new business. Going once, going twice. Gone. <laughs> this is the dictatorial approach to running a meeting. Okay, so chair closing comments. Brian, you can't say anything. All right, so I, I promised myself a long time ago that the Broken Compass Award had to go away because I was being too naughty with it. But that prompted me to think that maybe we ought to do a leadership award. But now, since I have a split personality to start out with, every meeting, you never know. It's going to be like, what? They, what's that saying? A box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So <laughs> today, we're going to do a leadership award. And as much as I have um, pinged, on the medical community's lack of engagement and understanding about how they can make their data available without overriding the concerns of HIPAA. I, yesterday afternoon at five o'clock in the afternoon, I received the J&J &J shot in the arm. 
And the reality is that that's under a year since this thing really got rolling along. And across the spectrum, the folks in the medical community, in my opinion, are heroes. They went to work every day, whether it was doing research, whether it was down there doing COVID testing, whether it was taking care of a patient on a ventilator or now inoculating us against this wickedly bad disease. So um, my hat is off to them. And um, with that, I think that takes us to our next EPC meeting. Quickly pull out your calendars. We need to make a decision. Do we? June is always problematic because of school winding down and who knows whether school will wander into the summer. We don't quite know, but um, Randy, your vice chair, what do you got? 10 or 17, does either one work? Can't hear you. Corey, what do you think? 17. She likes 17. Brian? They both Brad. work for me. They both work for me, Steve. Brad? Either is fine. Okay. Corey says 17. 17 it is. I'm very excited by the fact that we are going to have, um, I don't want to say it that way exactly, but for the first time, we're going to have a commercial entity come in to give us a presentation. The degree to which their technology um, can serve the greater community is substantial to the point where I've explained to them, we're not looking for the, you know, sell us your product thing. We're looking for, tell us how your product works. And it's a company called One Concern. It's got, a, I'm, I'm hearing that actually former administrator of FEMA, Craig Fugate, may be um, available to help open their presentation. And I would encourage you to mark that date down now that we know it, June 17th, info to follow. But um, again, I think you'll find the technology fascinating and uh, we'll go forward from there. And with that, <clears throat> I need a motion to adjourn. Do I hear such from the floor? No move. Second. Second. Um, all in favor, say aye. We don't do that online. All opposed, say nay. We don't do that online. And hearing nobody opposed, we are going to wrap up this meeting and shut things down for five minutes to cut over to Randy. And so go get a soda or whatever. Um, it looks to me like we're running a little bit behind. Randy, you think we can cut over in three? Yep. Okay. We'll be back at exactly three o'clock. Here we go. Thanks for attending, folks. We really appreciate it.